I have been informed that it is the Chandrarajas last Sunday with us. They are doing an escape to the country and are moving to East Barrel to uh, reach the stage of life where they can do that and opportunities. So I think David's in India, I've been told. So, But give Ruby and the kids a bit of love today and uh, we'll miss them. They've been wonderful. Well, they are wonderful and we'll miss them. Let's pray. Father God, um, open your word. By the mighty power of your spirit, Lord, we ask that as I speak and as we look at these six of these Ten Commandments, that you would open us up by the power of your spirit and challenge us to be transformed in Christ to love our neighbour. We ask in the Saviour's name. Amen. Back in uh, 1975, I was in year five. Papua New Guinea gained its independence from Australia. Uh, I did a school project at the time, so I remember it very clearly on that very topic. They had a ceremony. I think Gough Whitlam went over. The Governor General went over. One, I think Prince Philip might have come down or maybe Prince Charles. They had a big ceremony to say, this is now an independent nation. You can expect they probably signed some forms and had some songs and what have you. Well, here we are in Exodus, gathered at the mountain, around Mount Sinai. God has called his people out of slavery in Egypt to himself. And what happens around the mountain is kind of like a nation-forming ceremony. God's people, Israel, come together almost as a nation, which they weren't before. There is great fear because God appears over the mountain and the mountain turns to smoke and it's a fearful thing. And then God spoke all these words, chapter 20. I am the Lord, Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And following this in chapter 20, we get these 10 foundational words, all these words God spoke, which tells Israel, the newly formed nation, how they are to live as God's people how they're to be unique and different in the world. We call these ten words the Ten Commandments. And as Eric has already said, and as I said last week, you can virtually split them in two according to the same pattern that Jesus spoke. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in Matthew? And he said, oh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. That's the first four of the Ten Commandments. And the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So last week we looked at the first four, love the Lord your God, which were all about how we'd express our devotion to God. This week we're on the last six, which I think are really all about loving your neighbour as yourself. Now, I have read articles on the web or in magazines. It's quite common to see an article like, Five foundations for weight loss. And it'll say such things as eat less, exercise, cut back on sugar, sleep well. And you say, oh, wow, that's great. I wish I knew that before. <coughs> or three secrets for a better sex life, which are be available. Don't be a jerk. Say something nice. Or six steps for financial freedom, get a pay rise, <laughs> save money, invest in growth, get rid of credit card debt. You feel like saying, duh, when I read these articles. So here we are today, six simple rules on how to love your neighbour. Is it going to be like a web article, a magazine article that we're getting? Six simple steps Six simple rules for a different world order, really. But, you know, when I look at these six commands, I think they're quite an odd mix. Three of them are very short, very terse. In Hebrew, they're just two words. Others are longer. One has a promise. One is positive. It says to do something. All the others are negative. Don't do this. And... I think what's strangest of all is what's been left out. There's nothing there about don't gamble. 
There's nothing there about saying don't get drunk and act like an idiot or, or substance abuse. There's nothing about addictive behaviour. There's nothing about being lazy. There's nothing about being bullying and you'd think that today bullying is the big problem for everything. There's nothing about bullying. There's nothing about greed. There's nothing about whinging, harping and complaining. There's nothing about posting self-indulgent nonsense on social media. There's no commandment that says thou shalt not tweet. And I would have that in my ten. I know you may not. Instead, you know what we start with? Of those six, you know what the first commandment of those six is about social goodness? Honour your father and mother. Like as if that's the most important thing for health and for social cohesiveness. It sounds a bit trivial, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, you want to honour your mum and dad, we get that. But compared with don't get drunk and all the problems that drunkenness causes in society... Well, what I'd like to do is invite you to come with me because I think there is a pattern that unfolds in these six commands that, in a sense, perfectly tells us that we are not on the throne of the world, that actually the whole universe doesn't revolve around us and our desires and our needs. Instead, these ten commandments, the first four, put God first, the Creator first, and then the others, well, they take us off the throne. And I believe that if we actually were to start living these six simple rules from the heart, there would be radical transformation in society, in family, and most importantly in our own relationships, in our own lives, and how we love our neighbour. Imagine a world where no one stole. Imagine a world where people told the truth all the time. Imagine what society would be like. It would be like heaven. I believe it would lead to a radical joy if we could just follow these six simple rules. And here's what I believe is going to happen with these six rules. Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to desire, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It chops us in half. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. That is what the word of God does. That is what these ten commandments do, these ten words. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him before whom we must give an account. That is what I believe we're dealing with this morning. It's time for some surgery. Because I think these last six words, rather than being boundary markers, don't step over the line. Oops! rather than being boundary markers, become a sword that opens us up and expose us, expose our sin and our selfishness and our rebellion and that we need to change before God and before one another. We need a saviour. In many ways, we'll start with the words, in many ways I think the strangest of all of them is the very first one, which I've already referred to. It's one of the longer ones. It's the only positive command. Honour your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's positive. It's not negative. It's quite general. It's hard to draw a line. When have you honoured your mother and your father enough? And it has a promise so that it may go well with you. But what, what about, why mum and dad? If you're married, isn't your marriage your primary relationship? Don't we say that? You've got to leave your mother and father and be devoted to your spouse? What about kids? If you've got kids, aren't they more important than your mother and your father? What about the king or your boss who you see every day? Why parents? That's the first one. I want you to note that this command is number five. This is, I think, the pivotal command, actually. It comes right after four commands on loving and honouring God. Who is your creator? 
who gives you life and breath and everything you have, who saves Israel, who is the Saviour, God who protects and cares, God who carried Israel on eagles' wings and brought them to himself out of the land of slavery, God upon whom we depend for all of life. That is the first four commands. The very next command relates to parents. And I believe it's pivotal because parents have a godlike place in our life, unlike any other relationship. And if you can relate to your parents rightly, it'll have a massive impact on how you relate socially. You see, you owe your life to your mother and father. They made you. You are 50% dad, 50% mum at the very DNA level. You are not independent of them in any way at all. And without them, you would not be. And your mother carried you for nine months, often in great discomfort, and then bore you in pain. Who was it that cared for you when you were helpless? Who was it who clothed you and fed you? Who was it who wept at night because you were upset? Who was it who educated you at great cost? Who cleaned your vomit and cleaned that filthy bottom when you were sick? Who worked hard and gave for you and sacrificed for you? And if they're still alive, probably continues to worry about you and want to show love and concern for you. And you know, even if you were abandoned as a child, you still bear their DNA. And if they abandoned you, somebody else raised you. Somebody else cleaned your bottom. And your mother still bore you all those months. Everything humanly you have comes from your parents. And as we grow, we rightly begin to separate from our mum and dad. This is the way God's made us. It's natural, it's good. We go through those teen years of tumult trying to work out our own sense of space and identity. We get to adulthood. But it is easy as we go through that process to begin to despise our parents and even to use them for our good. We start to become aware that they're fallible. I remember this happening with my own parents. I thought everything they did was just about right in the world. Not perfect, but they were the ones who understood the world. And then I start thinking, they're often foolish. They made lots of mistakes. And guess what? I suffered because of many of those mistakes. And I'm still bearing the wounds. And maybe I can get to that place where I say, I don't want to forgive those wrongs. Because I'm so deeply hurt by those wrongs from you, my parents. So I hold on to them. And as I've grown and become independent, I've learned to rebel against my parents' authority. And one day I discover, actually, I do not need you anymore. I can get by perfectly well on my own. And so I'm independent. And I'm free. So easy to despise. And so I avoid you when I can. And maybe I reject you because actually I've discovered that I am better than you are and I do not ever want to be like you. And I'm a bit better even if I, even as, and you, many of you know that, I am better even as I repeat the mistakes of my parents over and over and over and over again. And prove myself to be a fool not wanting to recognize it. That's the big difference. And I take what I can and wait for the inheritance and never forgive the offense and then fight with my siblings once they die. And I've never forgiven, never will forgive what they did to me. 
I'm independent. I'm free. I'm king. The fifth command, the fifth word says, honour your father and mother. Take yourself off the throne and start with this foundational relationship that shapes so much of who you are. Recognise rather your gratitude and your dependence. Stop being arrogant. Stop being foolish. Honour your father and mother. And if you can do that with mum and dad, maybe you can do that with others. And if you can't do that with your parents who have given so much, what hope do you ever have of doing that with anybody else who you don't know nearly as well? <clears throat> See, the heart of this command, I think, is to recognise that you're dependent. You're not God. You owe honour to others, in particular those parents, and you need to extend grace, recognising that they, like you, are imperfect. And it will look different at different stages. It will look different in different relationships. There's nothing wrong with healthy boundaries, but you need to honour. When you're a child, it will probably mean obedience. As you're a teenager... Some of you need to listen now. It will mean engagement. When you're in your 30s, it may mean patience and inclusion. When your parents get to old age, it will probably mean care and time. Because <clears throat> we want it to go well in the land to honour our parents so much of our anxiety and depression, so much of our mental struggles, I think, come from not dealing with crossing the line to honour our parents and we carry our baggage around and we repeat our baggage because we've never dealt with that foundational relationship from our side. I'm not expecting them to come to us. They've been coming to us their whole life. Come on, come on, will we grow up? Or will we always be the baby? Yeah. We want it to go well in the land. We want to actually not just honour our parents, but this whole principle that we're dependent. We want to honour our veterans who have served in the forces. We want to honour our police. We want to honour our politicians. There's so many people that we're dependent upon. We're not God, not the centre of the universe. I'm not an island. I need others. I'm dependent. And so I better most fundamentally start by honouring my mother and father. And it's, let me be honest with you, I do this every Sunday almost. So I'm used to looking at your faces. And many of you are disturbed today as I say this. And so many of you have got some work to do to take the step to show honour to your parents. Whatever that means at your stage of life. Do not wait for the wedding speech. Do not wait for the funeral. Don't even wait for Father's Day or Mother's Day. Love your neighbour as yourself. Start with your parents because you're not the king. You're dependent. The next command... Next word. Well, it really ramps things up. Honour the father and mother. It sounds pretty trivial. This one goes to the top. You shall not murder. That's a big deal. To murder is to take someone's life, to take someone out of your life, sorry, by their death, for your advantage or your preference. It's to say your existence doesn't matter as much as my me and my preferences. My life would be better without you. You're gone. Cool. Now, this do not murder seems to be basic to just about every law code. Murder is wrong. It's heinous. Isn't it funny with our political debates at the moment? It's heinous 
It's heinous for my advantage to take someone out of my life by death for my preference. It's heinous. Well, at the moment we're having an abortion debate. Because it's all about my preference, my choice, my body, women's rights. And it doesn't suit my preference for this life to stay. So we'll legislate it even up to term. Even for sex selection. Because I want a boy, not a girl. It's heinous. God says, do not murder. Which is, in other words, to say other people matter. Their lives matter. God gives, God takes, and you're not God. And the world doesn't revolve around you. You're not on the throne of the universe to take someone else's life at whim. Other people's lives matter as much as your own. You shall not murder. Every life is sacred. It comes from God and is as valuable as any other life. Other people matter. That's the whole point. When Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, he actually addressed this command. He said, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I tell you, says Jesus, here's what it's really all about. Other people matter. Anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister like jerk, raka, is answerable to the court. Or if anybody says you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Other people matter. It's not all about you. You are not God. You are not the judge. You are not the centre of the universe. Love your neighbour as yourself. Other people matter. Seventh word is equally terse and direct. You shall not commit adultery. In other words, you're not to be sexually unfaithful in marriage. Now, that's a pretty easy line to draw. Don't be sexually unfaithful, unless, of course, you're Bill Clinton. And then you can argue, argue about whether I was sexually unfaithful. Did I go that far? When is unfaithfulness unfaithfulness? When is adultery adultery? It's not just Bill Clinton. See, I think this is saying something far more than a rule of sexual conduct. I think what it's saying is that marriage matters. See, if other people matter, then relationships matter. And the deepest, most intimate relationship we as human beings have, uh, can be called into is that one flesh covenant partnership of marriage between a man and a woman for life. That is the pinnacle as, as our created beings of relationship. And from marriage comes security, the promise of family, which is the foundation of society. You know, you hear that little phrase that family is the foundation of society. It's true and marriage is the foundation of family. So in community, we need to honour the integrity of marriage and adultery Sexual unfaithfulness is the ultimate breach of that fidelity. We're going to the pointy end. We devalue sex and we devalue family beyond the, beyond the confines of marriage. We do that to our peril. To say that marriage matters is to say that faithfulness matters, that promises matters, that family matters. So do not commit adultery. There's the pointy end of the whole commandment. It's a line in the sand in a sense, but it's got big implications. Again, it's more than just sexual. It's more than that being able to draw that when is sex, sex line. Here's what Jesus says. And again, in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who, is, who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Because marriage matters. Your attitudes matter. Faithfulness matters. Relationships, trust matters. Love matters. Other people matter. So you've got to guard marriage at the heart level. 
because when you're doing that, you're guarding security, you're guarding love. And when you shatter marriage, and some of you have experienced this firsthand, everything falls apart. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. You shall not commit adultery. It's basic. The eighth word, there's, there's six words we're going through. The eighth word is also short and basic. You shall not steal. Simple. Simples. Don't steal. Don't take what is not yours. Property rights, intellectual rights, don't take what is not yours. It's kind of really basic. But again, will you notice how this command presumes that you are not at the centre of the universe, that you are not God. That it's not all about you. Because when we steal, we act as if the whole world is mine for the taking. I want it, I will take it. It ignores any sense of limitations, any sense of other and care for the other. It's all about me. I want, I take. If it's to my advantage, then it must be good. Because I am God and, and you're not. You're not worth as much as me and my desires. <clears throat> Theft breeds distrust and strife. You've heard the phrase, there is no honour amongst thieves. It's true. Because <clears throat> thieves are all grabbing, using. They're only looking for their own interests. But how different this command. How important it is for community that we do not steal. Imagine what it would be like if there was no theft. My insurance premiums would be much, much lower. Love your neighbour as yourself. Protect property, respect property rights. Do not steal. Rather, we're called to give, to look for others' interests and to give to them and to bless them. The ninth word. I'm hoping you're beginning to see the ratio, I think, descending down from principles. This principle that we're dependent, we're not the centre, and it's going to really big things of other people matter, relationships, marriage matters, property rights matters and it's descending down to even more practical personal expression. The ninth word is related to speech and truth. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. In other words, what you say matters. When you cannot trust what people say, anarchy reigns. I'll say whatever I want to suit my purposes. You'll say whatever you want to suit your purposes. And none of us can be believed. And we don't believe it. And everyone becomes self-serving as if they are God and the world revolves around them. And we might say, you can't tell me what to say. I'm free. <laughs> even as I pour out lies, and this happens, even as I pour out lives and half-truths to suit my own interests over and against yours. I tell you, do the Ten Commandments matter? I've never lived in North Korea, but I've read about it. Lies, murder, the print, the, everybody's just protecting their own self-interest from the top down. And as much as you feed the self-interest of the guy at the top, you win. And truth doesn't matter and other people don't matter. Things are expendable. I don't want to live there. These Ten Commandments are powerful. What you say matters. Again, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, he talks about swearing. People used to swear, right? They say, oh, I swear by this, I swear by that. Almost as a way of manipulating the truth. If I swear in a certain way, I can do certain things. If I swear in another way, then I've got a bit more freedom. Jesus says, do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair of your head white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. Just what you say matters and speak the truth. In love, we're told. When you speak the truth, you love your neighbour because you give telling them they can trust you. See, we're, we're now talking about really the most personal part of our very, very being because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
We express truth or falsehood through our lips. We're down to the level of our lips. Love your neighbour as yourself. But you know, it goes even deeper than just our lips. We come to the tenth word and the goalposts shift. Whoops, there's my picture again. The tenth word. The goalposts have moved. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbour. We have gone beyond the external. We've gone beyond the line in the sand that is out there into the imperceptible thoughts of the heart that only God sees. So the big problem so far is that with these commands is we want to put ourselves at the centre and imagine that we are God and that the world should revolve around us. But this problem is not a problem out there impinging in upon us. It's a problem in here. It's in our heart. It says, I want to go it alone. I don't need anyone else. I want to do what I want to do. I want to have what I want to have. I want to be unrestrained by others except to serve my own passions and my own desires. And it's our heart that tells us I'm not getting what I deserve. But they're getting it. I don't like that. Why don't I have that? We covet, we desire, it leads to jealousy and envy and resentment, which soon leads to lies and theft and unfaithfulness and distrust and adultery and murder and disregard for anyone but me, the king of the universe. Can you see that this tenth word goes to the root cause? What you think matters. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. Desire, long for. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife. Oh man, look at what I've stuck with. No! You shall not covet their male or female servants, those who work for them and an expression of their wealth or their ox or donkey, their herds, which show that they've got so much more than you do. You're not to covet anything that belongs to your neighbour. And only God sees this command being breached or obeyed. There is no clear line to draw as to when I'm coveting or not. It's a matter of the heart. And it's expressed in dissatisfaction. My brother-in-law came around last night. He was so excited. You know why he was excited? He just bought a Tesla. He drove his Tesla to our house. You know what? I don't have a Tesla. And I can honestly say I don't care. But then he started talking about the fish tank in his son's house, in his son's bedroom that they've just set up, and I had to get rid of my fish tank when we renovated because my wife didn't want me to have a fish tank. And then I started coveting. Oh, I wish I had a fish tank again. I'm not a big car person. But, you know, I bet you, some of you would love to. You could just see Joe was so excited about his Tesla. And I don't, good on him. But I might... I might, um, I might covet his good looks. You might covet someone else's figure or their eyebrows or their bank account, the holidays that they go on that you don't go on, their job, their status. You know what we're told? Timothy, Paul to his protege Timothy, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. This is really the hardest word. Because I can honestly say that I've never killed anyone. I'm pretty sure I haven't. Externally. But to be content. Oh, I've got a country mile to go there. To be content. To be in control of my earthly passions and desires. To be glad for what I've got. To love my neighbour rather than to resent my neighbour. So that I'm, you know, in my heart, I'm more interested in their well-being irrespective of what they have or don't have. 
than my own well-being? You see, that is deep transformation. That is not going to come around by law-keeping, by setting rules for yourself. This is deep transformation. And this is what God calls us to if we are to love our neighbour as ourself. To recognise that I'm not God. God gives and God takes. I'm his servant. And he's placed me in community dependent upon others to serve them. Whatever their situation. Whether they have a Tesla or a 10-year-old Renault. I'm going to be content and love my neighbour. And God spoke all these words. Love God, love your neighbour, and then God finished speaking and, well, frankly, it all seemed too much. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance. And they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we'll listen to you, but do not have God speak to us, we will die. Enough of this, enough of these words, enough of this fire and smoke. They made this plea and Moses then mediated. Firstly, he told them, don't be afraid, God has come to test you so that the fear of God will keep you, will be with you to keep you from sinning. Isn't that weird? Don't be afraid because I want you to fear God. God's doing to say you fear him, he's testing you. So that you won't sin. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Moses, the mediator. God, in a sense, has drawn a line, marked a boundary, saying, do not cross over these boundaries. That is sin, that is rebellion. That is not how you are to live as my holy people. The problem we have, though, I think I'm hoping you've seen, the problem is that the boundary line is not a line out there where we set lots of rules. Do not commit adultery so I can go so far, but not so far. The boundary line's in here, in the heart. And it goes cut straight through our rebellious, self-serving heart that want to exalt ourselves over against others and against God. And the boundary exposes us. And we stand condemned like the people of Israel before God in his awesome, fearful holiness. And we too, like the people, say, I've got to stand at a distance. Can you just sew me back up and stop cutting me open lest I be exposed and condemned? We should be fearful before these words. Because they should, God willing, drive us to seeking reconciliation, as the people did. Almost saying, we need a mediator. We cannot face God. We need someone to enter the thick darkness where God is on our behalf. We need someone who can teach us these words in our hearts and our minds. See, the New Testament tells us the law of Moses, and which includes these ten words, have been given to reveal our sin. To make us feel cut. And to help us see the fearful majesty of God so that we appreciate the gap which is unbreachable and then run to the Saviour. Cry out for a mediator who can enter the darkness for us. And face the wrath of God against our sin for us. The law is good because it opens us up to seek mercy and grace. And God is good because he has provided a mediator in Jesus. Who did enter the darkness where God was. Who bore the wrath of God for our sin in our place. And so when we put our faith and trust in him we can, like Christ, stand before God in full obedience as those who do fulfil the law, forgiven. And he pours 
God in us, the Spirit within. The Spirit comes within so that the law of God is not written on lines drawn out here, but written where it needs to be written in our hearts. Convicting us of sin and righteousness and judgment. so that we desire to hold fast and love our neighbour, not out of fear, but out of love with joy. For God, because we love God, and we actually love our neighbour as ourselves. When you do that, you get a community of changed hearts, which is a changed community, which is what I pray we would increasingly be, inclusive, and humble people who have been saved by a great God people who can say listen I belong I'm shaped by love and I've found my place in the family of God Amen